Okay, welcome. I guess we're going to uh, start. Um, we're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Mingxing Pei, who is going to share his latest research and thinking regarding the development of kleptocracy in China. The program that I lead here at the Hudson Institute, the Financial Corruption and Autocracy Initiative, is focused on the policy issues posed by the advance of kleptocracy in autocratic regimes that increasingly threaten U.S. security. So we are particularly interested in Dr. Pei's research. Our focus is primarily on China and Russia. Regarding Russia, on December 9th, also at noon, we will have Karen DeWisha here, who will present her recent book, Putin's Kleptocracy. Dr. Pei is currently the Tom and Margot Pritzker Professor of Government and George Roberts Fellow and Director of the Keck Center for International and Strategic Studies at Claremont McKenna College. He has a BA from Shanghai International Studies University, a Master's and PhD from Harvard. And as to his areas of expertise, he is so well known, I don't think I'll talk about that or list off his books and many publications. Um, so, uh, the, so I think I'll leave it at that. Now the format here is Dr. Pei is going to speak, and then I will ask him one or two questions, and then we will throw it open to the floor for Q&A, and we'll have quite a bit of time for Q&A. So thank you very much. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pei. <laughs> Maybe I'll go up and stand. stand. It's easier for me. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, it's, a, it's really great to be back, even though the weather is not that nice compared with where I am now, Southern California. I, uh, but the topic that brings me here is one that interests all of us, because well, uh, the direction in which China is going will affect the, the welfare of um, all the countries in the world. Uh, kleptocracy uh, is not a word one should use lightly. In my own writings, I avoided this word for a long, long time. But roughly about a year ago, I concluded that this description, that the word does apply to China. But as you would know, toward the end of this talk, Chinese kleptocracy is very different from the Russian kleptocracy. Uh, what got me interested in this research is not kleptocracy, but something associated with kleptocracy. Uh, that is what uh, that is not, uh, typically called crony capitalism. Crony capitalism is quite uh, is a popular term, just like kleptocracy. But for scholars, you have to define a term analytically. That is how the term can be used uh, in a more or less rigorous way in understanding the phenomenon itself. Uh, I, uh, I looked at the literature, and I, it seems to me that the term clo uh, crony capitalism, which leads to kleptocracy, the, the worst form of cro crony capitalism is kleptocracy. Crony capitalism is characterized by one uh, one feature, that is collusion among elites. If you take away the collusion part, there's no crony capitalism. Because uh, crony capitalism essentially refers to the, collabor the illicit collaboration between all kinds of elites, political elites, economic elites, and I would even include criminal elites, organized crime. And uh, the, in this collaboration, the key is to how to uh, create a two-way street, two-way traffic. That is, money power can be used to uh, generate profits, money, and then money can be used to, in, to acquire power. And it's a, it's a circular system. So in the worst uh, case scenario, when this system is fully developed, you're going to have a kleptocracy. 
And so if you apply this framework, this concept, and then look at China, what you would find that this marriage between money, between power and money, was a relatively recent phenomenon. That is, in the, I, I've been fascinated by the issue of corruption for a long, long time. So when I look at the, 90, uh, the 1980s, uh, there were corruption cases. But it would be very hard to characterize those cases as a systematic alliance, including all kinds of elites. Uh, and, in a, uh, and that kind of in alliance is an enduring alliance. That is not just a one-time, uh, one-shot transaction, but it's repeated transaction, repeated interactions between uh, uh, among different elites. That kind of uh, phenomena did not exist in the 1980s. Uh, 1980s was a one-shot corrupt deal, that's it. But after the 1980s, uh, corruption not only uh, was more widespread, but corruption took on a repeated character. Uh, character. So, uh, and then so uh, if you uh, take one step further, you would find that not only uh, corruption uh, is much more systematic, uh, but also corruption becomes, uh, uh, has become, since the early 1990s, much more collusive in nature. That is, uh, cases involving multiple individuals uh, are prevalent. The data I've collected uh, suggest anywhere between 30 to 70 percent of the cases now discovered by anti-corruption investigators in China involve multiple individuals. The Chinese government defines collusive cases in two, uh, by using two firms, uh, two terms. Uh, if in one institution they found a case that involved more than three people, they call this a nest of corrupt officials. <laughs> Quite figurative. And if, they f if the same case leads to three or more individuals outside a particular institution, in involving other institutions, then they call this a string of corrupt officials. Uh, those who know Chinese would know one is called Wu An, the other is called Tuan An. These cases now tip range, the Chinese government does not publish an aggregate number on the, such cases. So I have to look at a variety, many uh, uh, cities and provinces and track their reporting. I've tracked probably more than 20, 25 jurisdictions. So the range is about 30 to 70%. So if you take the median, probably I would say half of the cases nowadays in China, uh, uncovered by anti-corruption authorities would be considered collusion cases. So if something that did not occur before a certain date, and then after a certain date, that particular phenomenon becomes widespread. You know, some, you know uh, something in the environment must have changed fundamentally to create an incentive for that kind of behavior. So now, the, uh, because scholars are essentially detectives, so the, as a detective, as an academic detective, my job is to find what has changed. In order to find that, you have to uh, make some assumptions. So the, the most important assumption is that corruption uh, involving ma many individuals perhaps because of two things. One is that uh, uh, corruption now requires cooperation among different officials. And another event, which, is, uh, which I will explain in detail later, is that before the 1980s, you would not find cases where officials would bribe their superiors to get appointed. But after 1990s, this again became very, very prevalent. And that suggests that political power became more valuable after 1990s. So why would political power become more valuable? There are two assumptions. One assumption is that what Chinese society uh, became more, more wealthy and political power would reflect the wealth of society. That 
uh, that's understandable, but it does not actually jibe with uh, reality. That is, the price of political power, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the amount of corruption income that can be generated by politi political power far exceeds the wealth. That is, I look at uh, corruption income. Uh, if you look at the high end, that is, these are the big cases. Essentially, th uh, this is number two. The early 1980s, uh, China never reported a case of corruption, bribery, exceeding 1 million yuan. 1 million yuan is roughly $150,000. Uh, because the Chinese living standard, uh, the Chinese income is about one-sixth of the U.S. So the purchasing power of 1 million yuan is roughly equal to $1 million. So in other words, if you want to think in comparable terms, that before 1988, there was not a single case. Then starting in 1988, and the first, uh, because the Chinese authorities released corruption numbers in five-year intervals. Uh, the, so I looked at five-year intervals. Uh, 88 to, 2000, to 1992, they first began to report mega cases, and roughly about 16 people a year who would be found to have, uh, who were found to have taken more than a million uh, yuan in bribes. But last year, when they released the number and I compared, then th this number jumped to uh, 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 double, triple. Essentially, it, uh, uh, it, it quick, within, five, uh, within 10 years, if I'm, my memory is correct, it, it rose to uh, something like 160. But last year, when they uh, released the number again, it's 2,500. Uh, 2, so within uh, 24 years, uh, just look at that number alone, you will find that uh, the number of mega cases has increased about 160 times. So that, uh, if, uh, of course, it's, a, it's incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to estimate the amount of corruption in the Chinese economy, in the Chinese state. But if this number gives us some idea that is power can attract, uh, the, amount of, the amount of money that can be converted by political power has increased enormously in China. So how can power be used to extract money from society? So th this is the research question. Uh, and it has to involve opportunities to gain windfall profits. Because you just cannot, uh, you don't get very rich by collecting small sums of money regularly. You get rich very quickly by getting hold of a very variable piece of property. So this leads me, this clue leads me to look at property. China did not have the same kind of privatization program as Russia. But China has had a privatization program. In Russia, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union led to a very chaotic free-for-all privatization <coughs> program, uh, which enabled a lot, uh, not a lot, a small number of people to become kleptocrats in Russia. But China did not have that. It was still today, China uh, has uh, uh, many versions of Russian kleptocrats. So how did that happen? And I look at China's privatization program. China calls this property rights reform. Yeah, they always have euphemisms for uh, these policies. So uh, they began after 1992. Uh, uh, China began very gradually to uh, do two things. One is to uh, change the property rights of land, mines, and state-owned enterprises. As a result, private individuals could uh, own, uh, not necessarily own them outright, but at least derive enormous benefits uh, by so-called leasing their rights. And uh, so this is one important uh, development. Before that, you just could not gain very valuable assets in China, land, mines, or state-owned enterprises. 
but after 1992, you could. The, and this change was accompanied by another very important development, that is the control, uh, the decision power over the allocation of such property, which uh, was progressively decentralized. That is, as initially, if you want to touch that piece of land, this land this size, you need the approval of the state council, the Chinese cabinet. Now, a local mayor can decide what. So the problem with these two issues is that Chinese private property, uh, China's property rights reform was not complete. The clearest, if you want to privatize, you want to privatize, uh, you want to have genuine privatization or complete privatization. That you have to find real owners. China's, pro private, uh, uh, China's property rights reform failed to actually find real owners. So at the end of the day, the state still remained the owner, even though many, many officials were allowed to control and decide and dispose the property. This is the worst combination. That is, you have no owners, no real owners, but you have a lot of thieves who could steal. But there's another catch. That is, because the property rights are so unclear, no real owner, many officials actually have claims, have power over the disposal of property. And that necessitates, that creates the uh, condition for collusion. That is, if you want to steal a piece of land, a piece of, uh, steal a mine, or steal a st piece of state-owned enterprise asset, you actually have to go through a, multi a large number of officials in order to get all the chops. And so, uh, so this is, I believe, uh, uh, the institutional origin of crony capital. That is, the incomplete privatization coupled with decentralization of control over property. This is the academic uh, theory. Uh, because uh, once somebody who can go through this uh, thicket of bureaucratic control and gain that valuable property, that person can be, in, uh, can be assured of enormous profit. So now the problem I uh, uh, have is that well, in my research, I looked at more than 200 cases. What I found is that the culprit in the center of this is not an official. An official, of course, is, is the person who gets caught. But the person who made the biggest amount of money out of this is a private entrepreneur. And uh, it makes sense for the private entrepreneur to play the role as, as uh, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, benefit more than the than officials in this because the private entrepreneur, uh, after all, has to put a lot of risk capital uh, into all of this. But uh, my uh, initial question is, why wouldn't official Chinese, uh, why wouldn't Chinese officials themselves take the risk and seize a mine, a piece of real estate, and then become billionaires themselves? Uh, with the exception of the very top officials in China, most Chinese officials are not billionaires. The billionaires are those entrepreneurial, smart, private entrepreneurs who have connection with officials. So, uh, so this question is, why wouldn't Chinese officials themselves go into in the Chinese parlance called jumping to the sea and become very wealthy themselves? Uh, I thought about this, and I reached this conclusion uh, that it's actually quite difficult for Chinese officials to directly seize private, uh, to seize uh, state-owned assets uh, themselves and become uh, 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 billionaires uh, or very wealthy uh, people. Uh, one is that for a long time, until very recently, very large Chinese-owned uh, state-owned, uh, very large state-owned enterprises are off limits. They just cannot do anything with their, uh, uh, with their uh, assets. 
So uh, uh, you cannot create very large fortunes overnight. The second problem uh, has to do with officials' incentives. Because most Chinese officials spend their entire life trying to get to the top. In other words, they've had a lot of sunken cost. They've invested too much in their political capital. And all of a sudden, they have to essentially write off their political investment and then go into an diff entirely different and highly uncertain career. And they are reluctant, most of them. When, when I look at the careers of some very successful private businessmen, uh, what I found is that they decided to abandon the, to write off their political investment very early on, when they were very junior officials. Uh, they were relatively young. Uh, they did not uh, uh, have very senior status, so it was easy for them to walk away from their political investment. But for people up to, say, county level, if you want to uh, be promoted to a county magistrate, you must have invested at least 15 years in the system. And that's a long, uh, that's a very significant uh, part of one's life. Uh, that's why I have not found a single case of a county level official walking away and becoming a private entrepreneur. Uh, another problem for them is that it is, uh, if you want to seize a piece of state owned property, you actually have to put up some risk capital yourself. And Chinese officials don't have a lot of cash they, uh, to buy a mine, buy a piece of land right away. And uh, they are also constrained by another fact, is that these officials are very good political entrepreneurs. They know which uh, patron to latch up to, but they're not good businessmen, most of them. So they, uh, they are constrained by, A, their inability to spot a severely undervalued property whether a mine actually will produce or a piece of land will actually lead to a profitable development. See, they, most of them don't see. Private entrepreneurs can see that. And another problem for them is that even if they seize a piece of land or mine, uh, they're not good businessmen. Because you actually, uh, to generate the, f the f uh, to fully realize the profit, you have to be pretty good businessmen. Uh, so that's why they, uh, the Chinese officials are not, we, do, we do not find Chinese officials to be uh, kleptocrats. Uh, another question I have is that why, again, in my case, I do not find, except for the very senior people, I do not find officials' children to, uh, to be engaged in such activities. Why not if, if they, they themselves could not own the mine or uh, grab a piece of land, why didn't give it to their children? Uh, it is just a quirk because China follows a very strict hierarchy in terms of promoting its officials. So at the, most of my cases involving lower level officials. When you're high level, of, when you reach the level of the central uh, uh, government leader, then you have grown up kids. They can go into business. Uh, but most mid-level, low level Chinese officials have children who are way too young to run a company or to to go into business themselves. So that's why at the lower level, you, uh, uh, that is not an option. At a higher level, that's an option. And that option actually is preferred by senior Chinese leaders, as I will see uh, later on. So uh, this means that uh, officials in China follow a very clever strategy in maximizing their power to, uh, to get uh, um, to uh, extract as much wealth as possible from the wealth of the Chinese state. Uh, for the senior level officials, uh, they typically have access to much more valuable assets than lower level officials. For example, the, uh, late, uh, this mega case, uh, Zhou Yongkang, the former uh, internal security chief, I looked at the newspaper coverage of his son's activities. His, his son is uh, wealthy beyond imagination. But where did his son's wealth come from? Most of his son's wealth comes from two sources. One is to grab, a, uh, to go into business uh, buying a power plant and then flipping it to the state-owned uh, company for 
10, 15 times the value. This is one. You uh, get a p private property and then sell it to the state company. And then the other is to buy an oil field, actually, in China. Buy an oil field from uh, CNPC, China state-owned, the, the biggest Chinese state-owned company, and then sell it to a private entrepreneur for 10, 15 times the markup right, right away. So be essentially, the uh, children of very senior officials have this, uh, 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 this access to enormous uh, uh, assets owned by the state, and they can gain such assets at very, a huge, a very uh, steep discounts. But they actually do not, as I said, they do not run these assets. They do not operate these assets. What they do is flip. I have not seen a case where uh, they do not flip. They always they quickly flip, and that, uh, uh, that makes sense for them because uh, they're, uh, they're not good uh, in terms of operating assets. Uh, but for... Uh, uh, and these uh, senior Chinese officials, uh, uh, again, compared with lower-level officials, that is, uh, uh, they, uh, they are far more successful uh, because uh, they have overseas partners. They have private sector partners. Uh, so their risk capital is much bigger, more diverse. And also, in contrast with uh, lesser officials, they are much more sophisticated in money laundering. Uh, as uh, I, I will tell you how difficult it is for local officials to launder money, to actually hide their ill-gotten uh, wealth. Uh, the only puzzle I have is the, uh, 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 is the case involving a Chinese, very senior Chinese general. Uh, yesterday in the Hong Kong newspapers, there was a story about this Politburo member one of the two vice chairmans of the Central Military Commission. The, this is the China's military command. He, uh, and that newspaper is quite credible because uh, it is uh, supposed to be connected with the Chinese government. Uh, it is, the newspaper story says that when the investigators went to this, uh, this senior general's house, which happened to be 20,000 square feet, uh, luxury house in Beijing, and went to his office, they found a ton of cash. Gold, uh, multi, Swiss watches, arts. It took 16 military trucks to, uh, to take them away. <laughs> so my worry is why is this guy not as sophisticated as civilian counterparts uh, in laundering money? Well, this is for some uh, in, uh, creative uh, investigative journalists uh, in the audience to find out. This is the only, but all the other uh, uh, officials, senior officials, they all, again, the, the cases, they all have overseas bank accounts. Uh, uh, in fact, I found that uh, they would uh, have, uh, uh, they prefer Hong Kong dollars and US dollars uh, as bribes. They don't like uh, Chinese currency because Chinese currency, the biggest denomination is 100 kwai, which is like 15 bucks. Uh, Hong Kong, uh, actually, Hong Kong denomination is, uh, is, uh, is, is 1,000, so a lot smaller. Uh, and uh, so for lower-level officials, they have a very different calculation, uh, and they face different challenges. Uh, they have a lot smaller, they can only steal smaller assets. So they have to steal more often in order to gain the same kind of uh, 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 profit. Uh, and uh, because they don't have sons or proxies to flip assets, they prefer direct bribes. So they would not even uh, pretend to be the middleman. They just say, if you give an official a million or half a million, he will get the deal done for you. Uh, what is, uh, uh, and uh, uh, also, but local officials have enormous difficulty. This is one of the surprising things findings I have in money laundering. We think that China is full of clever officials who know how to get their money abroad. Actually, the reality is quite complex. Uh, they, the, the most prevalent way of money laundering in China is the real estate. They, because real estate, you can, hide, uh, you can hide a lot of cash. 
uh, they're expensive. So uh, local officials now, they all use their children. Some, in one case, a three-year-old baby is the legal owner of a multi-million dollar uh, apartment in Shanghai. Uh, so they, uh, so once, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, the, the perennial challenge is where to hide the cash. And some, sometimes they could uh, become desperate. And in one case, one official, this is just a story I just cannot help not uh, sort of uh, uh, withholding from you. Uh, there's this local official who uh, tried to hide one million yuan in cash, which weighs about 20 pounds. <laughs> Pretty big. Where could he hi uh, hide it? This, finally, he decided to put in his father's grave. A very bad idea. If you know the Chinese, this is the last place <laughs> you want to <laughs> hide your loot. And he was caught. Uh, I think that must have something to do with his father's unhappiness of being possessed of stolen goods. <laughs> and uh, but it's all of it. Uh, so wh whenever they uh, and they just uh, another constraint is that they uh, uh, they uh, those official uh, when you see them, even some, sometimes they wear expensive watches. There's not um, uh, they don't have a lot of alternative to spend their money. So by the time they get caught, uh, most of the money they stolen or uh, uh, took in as bribes will actually be returned uh, to the government. Uh, so this is, uh, so uh, uh, just to summarize, the, there are sort of four sources of windfall profits for Chinese officials uh, at all levels. Real estate is the biggest because this is, uh, in China, land is the most expensive, the most valuable. Second would be mining resources, uh, especially coal mines. Uh, and to a less extent, uh, uh, metal. Uh, uh, then third would be uh, state-owned enterprises. They allow state-owned enterprises to be corporatized, to be changed into stock company, joint stock companies, uh, or shareholding companies. And that process benefits a lot of local officials. Uh, and finally, uh, is official appointments. Because if you want to move ahead, you have to bribe somebody in order to uh, 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 get that uh, appointments. Uh, so I uh, took uh, uh, a look at 50 such cases. Again, those cases did not exist in the 1950s, uh, no, 1980s, that you would bribe somebody to get promotion. But after 19. 90, uh, 90s, it became very uh, widespread, even inside the military. The guy, the, the person, uh, the, the, uh, the, polybium, the former Polybium member and ex-vice chairman, his main crime was accept millions, hundreds of millions of, not hundreds of millions, uh, ten, tens of millions of dollars from one individual to secure his promotion inside the military. So I always joke, the Pentagon should not worry about the PLA. <laughs> Let them promote officials like him. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, so it's just wise. Uh, uh, and, uh, I looked at inside the police, inside the courts, uh, inside SOEs. This practice uh, 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 is uh, very popular. Uh, what I found uh, by looking at the, uh, these 50 cases uh, is that uh, eight different officials adopt different strategies, uh, uh, not surprise. S officials at a high level would sell fewer offices, but each office would fetch more. So uh, the, um, uh, the median amount of an office, uh, if, uh, suppose you're a city level official. Uh, you run uh, a jurisdiction of roughly two to three million people. It's Actually, pretty big. Uh, then he, uh, people who bribe him typically are county level officials because they want to get appointed. And the air, the median price, the median bribe is about a hundred thousand. So keep that number in mind: hundred thousand yuan, which is not that much. Uh, but you, if you go one level below, that is a county level official who would collect bribes from officials who work in the county government. A step down, the median price is about 20,000. So you can 
tell right away that power actual market works that way. People know that the higher you up you are, the more bribe generating uh, capacity you have. So the position is more valuable. The, mar the market move. Uh, you, you have to be impressed by how a market has developed. A uh, sort of crony capitalist market has developed inside the Chinese officialdom. And another interesting thing is that you, what you find is that officials actually uh, apply a huge discount to these valuable offices. The, the salary alone in that position would make your money back in one year. Uh, but why were they sell offices so cheaply. These offices are valuable because they could collect bribes, because they, these offices control the, the disposal of government property, so they're valuable. But why would a party secretary, who typically is the culprit in this game, why would he sell offices so cheaply? It's actually, it's very sensible for him. A, a party secretary at the local level stays in office for roughly about three to five years. So there is an expiration date on his power. If he does not take the bribe when he is in power, the, uh, the power will expire. And he does not know whether he will have another chance. And another consideration he has is that he really cannot go out and try to extract bribe from every private businessman who has to deal with the government. So essentially, he views the bribe as a commission. That he knows the person who pays the bribe will be collecting bribes. He just wants to get, uh, get a cut. And third is that uh, uh, by taking bribe from a small number of officials, he minimizes his risk for detection. If you take money from too many private entrepreneurs, more risks, and actually do not know uh, a lot about these individuals. So, so at the lower level, uh, uh, county of, uh, level officials, uh, try to maximize their income uh, by selling a lot of offices. So the average number of deals they do is about 33. So ev in my sample, uh, they will sell 33 positions uh, on average. Uh, and, uh, uh, but one level up, they, of course, per u the unit price is, much, is five times higher. Uh, and they do not want to take more risks. Uh, so their uh, strategy is to sell fewer, but sell at a higher price. So the number of deals, and uh, the average number of deals is about 13 at a, the next level uh, up. And, uh, but for these officials, another interesting finding is that uh, the bribes they collect from other officials uh, are uh, sensational. Shocking, political scandalous, politically scandalous. But uh, most of them actually also take bribes from private entrepreneurs. They are, the chief source of their corruption income is commercial bribery, not bribery by, the, by other officials. Uh, and uh, what, what I was also struck is by the low detection risk in this. That is, because I. Uh, Chinese uh, court documents will say when did this official when this official began to collect bribes when he was caught. So it's it's easy to uh, calculate the duration of corruption. On average, the duration of corruption in my sample is about seven years. Uh, so that's pretty long. Uh, actually, the more senior you are, the less the longer the duration. Uh, for prefecture level officials, it's nine years. For county level officials, five years. For pro provincial officials, it's 10 years, uh, and, uh, which means they, they get promoted while they are corrupt. And 80% of these officials get, uh, got promoted while they were collecting bribes from various sources, which means that the system actually is quite inefficient in detecting wrongdoing by uh, officials. And, uh, also, uh, another data uh, supports the idea that the uh, more senior an official is, the more, uh, the more corruption income he can generate by his power. Roughly, the, uh, the average amount of 
corruption income for a county level official is about 3.6 million. One level up is 6.4 million, if that's a, a, a prefecture city level. And then the provincial level is 8.6 million. So roughly, if you're prime minister, you generate twice the income. Uh, yuan, yuan, yuan. Uh, yuan, yeah. So, but the, uh, as I said, the purchasing power is about the same, <laughs> uh, if, if you think about this. Uh, and uh, uh, the sources of financing of these uh, 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 bribes uh, to purchase your government appointments actually uh, are also interesting. Uh, practically now use their private savings. It makes sense because they don't ac actually have, uh, uh, Chinese officials are not paid a whole lot in, uh, 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 in their nominal, in terms of their nominal salary. Uh, funds from three sources uh, come from, one, the savings from corruption income. Previous, so they are, they are very studious. They, they, they view the uh, journey to the top uh, just like a in private investor. They will save some corruption income and then use it to bribe to generate more income, good return. The other source is uh, public money. In one instance, actually, uh, several officials agreed to steal money from the public, uh, from one public account and to use that money to bribe a more senior official. Uh, and the third source is private, they would raise money from private entrepreneurs to purchase an office. Because private entrepreneurs know that if this person they invest in, if he gets promoted, that person will control a bigger piece of the pie, and they're going to get more benefits from this. So again, all of this is to suggest that uh, behind all the horror stories about corruption, very a very efficient market is operating. Unless you destroy the market, nothing is going to make any difference in terms of fighting corruption in China. Uh, Lastly, let me end on a very uh, worrisome note about uh, crony capitalism uh, in China, uh, particularly in, uh, 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 collusion within the system. Collusion has two, uh, uh, has, uh, collusion causes the decay of an institution. Uh, one thing I, uh, one um, uh, academic article I read about the former Soviet Union uh, written by the late Mansa Olson, very well-known political uh, economist. And he identified collusion as, a as the cause of the Soviet collapse. Because essentially, in a collusive system, the agents made the masters impotent. Because the agents would conceal information, the agents would, uh, uh, would effectively uh, privatize the power of the state. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think he's, he's onto something because uh, what in the Chinese case collusion has caused is institutional decay of the party state. That is, the, the, uh, the incentives, the norms, uh, the, uh, the internal uh, rules have all been uh, uh, degraded uh, significantly by this. Uh, uh, one dynamic is what I call bad money drives out good money. Because in the system with widespread collusion, people who collude will get ahead. People who do not collude will actually lose competitive advantage. Because uh, you're going to have patrons, uh, and if you, collect, if you take money from, from private in, uh, entrepreneurs, you will have corruption income to finance your bribes and get ahead. Uh, and uh, so the system uh, progressively degrades because of the bad money driving out good money dynamic. The other dynamic uh, of collusion is what I call copycat effects. That is, people who see other people engaging in collusion and then doing very well, uh, even if they are not in the, uh, if, if, even if they are not directly affected by the collusion act, they will say, "Well, this kind of behavior." Uh, pays off, and then they will imitate, they will uh, do the same. That's why uh, collusion spreads from one sector to another. It began in the economic sector, within the government, 
Now, if you know Chinese and you, all you need to do is type in Wu An. That, that, that is a Chinese term, the search term. And you'll, you'll be shocked at what kind of institutions are involved, uh, are now plagued by collusive corruption. Universities, hospitals, courts, uh, regulatory agencies, and last but not least, government-run funeral homes. <laughs> well, why is that the case? Because they actually have to uh, collude to set prices of cremation high uh, and, uh, 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 and all kinds of, uh, and they will split the, the proceeds <laughs> uh, uh, from the practice. So uh, uh, in conclusion, I would say that based on my academic research, uh, I was uh, endorsed the view that there is kleptocracy in China, but the Chinese kleptocracy dif differs from Russia in one key aspect. That is, it is a far more decentralized kleptocracy. The, the amount of money owned by a particular kleptocrat is perhaps a fraction of that of a Russian kleptocrat. But the number of kleptocrats in China relative to the Chinese uh, per capita income is actually very large. Uh, I do not know uh, uh, what it means, what it entails for China, but I uh, uh, venture to uh, I, uh, venture two ideas. One is that the current anti-corruption campaign does not deal, deal with the underlying causes of collusion or corruption in China, that's one, because uh, it does not deal with control of property. It does not deal with the promotion system. It deals with the superficial symptoms of corruption. Uh, uh, the other uh, thought I have is that uh, this is going to do long-term damage to not just, uh, not just China's economy, but I think to the prospect of democracy in China. Suppose this kleptocracy endures, survives this shock of democratic transition in China. Will China become a healthy democracy with equal distribution of political economic resources? I think you might have a situation where many kleptocrats survive, surviving the shock and returning to power as crony Democrats, <laughs> not crony capitalists plus, plus crony Democrats. So uh, on that rather gloomy note, I end my uh, uh, talk today. Thank you. All right. Well, I, I have to think of a gloomy question or two to start things off here before we uh, uh, op open it up to you all. Um, on this gloomy note, so, so Dr. Pei ended, ended with a, a gloomy prediction of how things may uh, move, move in China, but can you, can you spin that out a little more and especially tell us how you think the U.S. can constructively respond to this? What should U.S. policy be if we, uh, if we accept that this may be the way China's going? Well, uh, the U.S. can do very little uh, to influence China's future, uh, I would say. That, uh, uh, in terms of political change. But the U.S. can do something about the kleptocracy. Uh, that is, uh, 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 on two fronts. One is that in the future, a lot of the ill-gotten wealth in China will be moving offshore. To the extent that some of that will come to the U.S., the U.S. will have to include, increase scrutiny. So reporting requirements will have to be very stringent. And then vetting. Uh, of the people who invest. Uh, we welcome money, but we, wel we welcome only legitimate mon money. The other, on the other front is uh, money that goes into China. Uh, because uh, the, some of the cases that have come to light involve foreign partners, private equity money, venture capital money, uh, what have you. And on that front, the U.S. will also have to 
think about disclosure. That is, uh, there has to be some process of vetting. And uh, I think the architecture will be very difficult to do because the people who are going to go into China are wealthy uh, investors who have lobby, <laughs> enormous lobbying power, and they can kill those regulations. But to the extent that we can, I think these are the two things we can do to try to uh, uh, constrain the growth of kleptocracy. But now, if we, if we take a very cynical view, is it in U.S. interest to curtail or to encourage kleptocracy in China? Yeah, I, uh, I get this question all the time. Say, uh, that is, uh, you, you want to be Machiavellian? Then I think it's net-net. Whether a kleptocracy in China serves the U.S. interest or undermines the U.S. interest on balance, net-net. I would say net-net probably it hurts the U.S. interest. Let me explain why. Because the U.S., long-term U.S. interest is a just, peaceful, stable China, right? So if you have a kleptocracy in China, then China would, you, if you look ahead 20, 30 years, it might be a, a different version of today's Russia or something like the Philippines. Uh, certainly that's not in the U.S. interest. And on a more immediate note, that is, klepto kleptocrats can do uh, two things. One is that in a lawless environment uh, or poorly regulated environment, these kleptocrats can engage in trading activities, investment activities that undermine American security interests, economic interests abroad. And then we should not rule out the ability of kleptocrats to corrupt our own institutions. They are very smart people. They know the power of money. The power of lobbying. They come here, come here, purchase some uh, ex-congressmen, <laughs> ex-government officials, and they turn around, give, lend them a lot of prestige, legitimacy, and that's that's not, I think, what we would like to see. So, on balance, it's harmful. Well, on that note, I think we'll open it up to the audience. Do we have the mics ready there for questions? Any uh, any questions? The young man in front. Um, do I have to use it? Okay. Um, my question is here is, um, do you think that corruption, no matter in what countries, mainly in China, should be thoroughly eradicated or not? Because uh, I know even in America, and I know this is not a corruption here, but you, you have the access and you have the ways to impact the policy making and decision making process because yeah. you are stakeholders. And it's the same in China. On one hand, this is corruption, but on the other hand, as you can see, the entrepreneurs are going to give, give their money and officers will want to impact the promotion process. So that is actually, it, it, it's, a, it's a place that the stakeholders want to impact their, uh, impact their interests when the policy was making, right? But that's something happened everywhere, not only in China. So do you think it should be thoroughly er eradicated? Then how the stakeholders and how the interests of different people can be ref reflected on the policy and on the process. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, really very thoughtful question. Uh, first of all, it's impossible to eradicate corruption. You can minimize it to a level that is relatively insignificant. Uh, very clean countries, uh, I don't know, uh, because it, it, it depends on the, how you define corruption, but I said Norway, New Zealand, they just don't have that kind of corru corruption. So it's, it's a matter of controlled amount, minimizing uh, corruption. But the other one is that what makes corruption in China different from the U.S.? Two issues. One is the amount. Clearly, China is far more corrupt than the U.S. Uh, uh, the U.S. is, because I've, I've been looking at uh, corruption perception data, not entirely reliable, but you have an idea. The U.S. is not... Uh, uh, the U.S. score is 73. The higher the score, the better you are in terms of staying clean. The highest score is 90, New Zealand. The lowest score is Somalia, 8. So the median is 41. China is 39. So China is below median. So there's huge difference between 73 
So that is, you look at the, the relative amount of corruption. But the most important thing is the visibility of corruption. That is, I, if I have to pick two equally corrupt countries, okay, not an easy choice to make. One is that corruption is out in the open. Everybody knows who's engaged in what, doing money part changes hands and there's a record. The other is corruption in the black box. I think my personal preference is to see corruption out in the open because where there's open corruption, there's competition. If this politician takes $10, I'm going to bid 11 and get my, and so at some point the market will take over, the competitiveness. And then there will be also reaction to this. But in the case of China, is that you just do not see, you do not know what actually passes between among stakeholders. Very interesting. The gentleman in the middle. Oh, and I should have mentioned, you should, uh, please state your name and affiliation. Yeah. The gentleman on the aisle in the center. Hi. <clears throat> Larry Smarin, um, U.S. China Capital Cities Friendship Council. Uh, I guess I have, this is an excellent presentation. I guess I have one comment, and I've got a lot of questions, but I'll keep it to one or two. Uh, the comment is this, um, and maybe it's a linguistic uh, issue, but in studying like uh, the, the V.S. Prickard um, study on the Tammany Hall in New York, he differentiated between graft and corruption. Effectively said, graft is when you buy them and they stay bought. Corruption is when you buy them, but they don't stay bought. The way you're describing the system, it sounds like it's more a graft-driven system than a corruption-driven system. Uh, that, in effect, as bad as, it, as you describe it, it works, or at least it functions. Uh, the, the one who takes a bribe, you know, honors the bribe, and the bribe B uh, honors, you know, the relationship. So I call it graft, if you will. I guess now my questions would be this. Um, if you can articulate a little more on um, the difference, the regionalization in China, um, uh, as opposed to central government, how that works on the regional levels, or, and are there different dynamics, let's say in Sichuan versus Shandong versus Guangdong, and so on, how those dynamics work on that local level. You'd mentioned the mayor. Who, uh, who took bribes. He doesn't have to go up to uh, Beijing. And the second question, I guess, would be, um, and I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, the, the Corleone axiom, um, you know, a lawyer with a pen can steal more than 10,000 men with guns. Um, the level of, you know, is there a level of violence um, linked to uh, this system that you described uh, or is it, at least in terms of the physical aspect, relatively clean? Thank you. Yeah, uh, the, thank you. Uh, in terms of regional uh, patterns, uh, that is, officials in more wealthy areas get more bribes. Their power is more wealthy because the real estate, typically it's the real estate, the real estate in Guangdong is more wealthy. So the... Uh, the sample is that the average amount of corruption by a Guangdong official is probably several times that of somebody in Guizhou. Uh, then uh, uh, the, the only difference is Sanxi. Sanxi is a uh, coal-producing province, and their local officials can really collect huge sums of money because coal is very, uh, very, very valuable. Uh, then in terms of violence, in one of my chapters are looked at the collusion between police and organized crime. Organized crime in China uh, has now got, got into the real estate, local transportation, a seafood market, and uh, mining business. And in these areas, if the organized crime is involved, then there's violence. And organized crime is used apparently on quite wide scale, by local officials who want to evict people, who want to evict residents from their homes, and who want to evict peasants from the land. Uh, they don't use police, actually. They would, uh, they would first employ organized criminals. 
or, uh, to do the duty job. So there is some violence involved. Joe Bosco, formerly uh, with the Defense Department. Uh, nice to see you again, Min Chin. Uh, you joked about a general or a colonel military official who bought a promotion. But then later when you listed the uh, institutions that have been uh, corrupted, you did not mention uh, the military, the PLA. Can yeah. you comment on that at all? No, because PLA cases are strictly off limits. That is, you just do not. Uh, the Chinese government does not release except three or four cases over the last uh, 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 decade. Only three cases, one Sou Ye, who is a, a, a vice commander of the Navy, and then uh, Gu Junsan, who is a deputy uh, commander of the chief logistic department, and then Xu Cai Hao. But other than that, we just don't have any access. Because this is open source research. Mm. Uh, the gentleman on the front row. Uh, Bill Tucker, I worked in the White House Counsel's Office uh, during the Reagan administration, and I've done uh, a lot of work in China. I've, I've taken a number of U.S. companies into China, gotten them uh, set up and partners, et cetera. And uh, uh, my question, uh, I have uh, two questions. There's an article in the paper uh, today about uh, the corruption in the military yes. in China and the fact that uh, three of the top military people have committed suicide. And uh, so... I wondered if you had seen that article. No, I've not seen that article. I flew. I flew from Chicago at four o'clock in the morning. So. Okay. And, <laughs> and if you, anyway, if you had a comment on that. Yeah. And then, um, you know, secondly, uh, you know, we haven't encountered that much problem in uh, getting companies licensed and doing business and and getting a partner in China. Now, I'm not involved in their doing business once they're set up, so I don't know what they do then. But. Yeah. Uh, as you know, a lot of Chinese uh, have settled in uh, Canada, yes. especially the, uh, the Vancouver, western yeah. uh, part of China, because China allows them citizenship. I mean, uh, Canada, Canada allows yes. them uh, citizenship. And, and uh, why, why isn't the U.S. doing the same thing? Oh, the U.S. Is, the U.S. has EB-5 program, and the Chinese are 80% of all the visas <laughs> go to China. And, but... Go, go to Chinese citizens. The first one, uh, I, I have not read about uh, the generals committing suicide, but I would not be surprised. Uh, because the, in the last year, a lot of local officials are reported to have committed suicide. So this, because think about the enormous psychological st stress you are under. Because the Chinese government, if they want, uh, want to take you in, they do this at the last minute, so you don't know. You worry about this all the time. In, uh, in China, a new term has surfaced. It's called instant kill. <laughs> because an official who uh, could be standing up denouncing corruption in the party, and then the next minute he would be hauled away for corruption. So this, uh, so I'm not surprised at all. Uh, I think, well, I've answered your other, uh, other question, but uh, uh, there's a, a huge influx of investors from China. We do not know how many of them are legit, how many of them are not, uh, but the U.S. does have this program. And now uh, European countries have that program as well. Thank you. Uh, Abe Shulsky from uh, Hudson. Um, this latest uh, answer raises the question of why, if uh, many of these high officials have money overseas and may have homes or their s children are going to school uh, overseas, why they don't leave. In other words, it um, would seem that rather than committing suicide, it would, would have made more sense for some of these guys to move to Vancouver. Uh, yeah. Well, and I just uh, wonder why why we haven't Chinese seen Chinese officials it. actually are high are closely monitored. If you are a minister level official, vice minister level official, you don't have passports, unless you have some illegal uh, 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 or docu travel documents, uh, and they can only go abroad twice a year, and those visits have to be approved by. Uh, 
If you're vice minister level, it will have to be approved by a vice premier. Now we're uh, uh, we're talking very strict, and even local officials say it's very hard for them to travel because again they don't have travel documents. Uh, so uh, I, I'm sure they've thought about this, and the practical difficulty seems to be quite insurmountable. <laughs> Um, Su Ming Fu from Georgetown University. Uh, we see that corruption is actually threatening CCP's own legitimacy. We already see the unrest going on. Um, so there, must, there might be a broad question, but what do you think are the institutional changes that the Chinese government should do or uh, could do to mollify the corruption derived from privatization, uh, incomplete privatization and decentralization? If um, complete privatization is the way out, what Chinese government should do to make sure that um, people still have equity that we do not end up a Soviet Union? Yeah. Uh, again, uh, well, on several fronts, I think privatization, you have to, if you want to do it, you have to have a robust regulatory system, capital markets, so that you would not want to sell to large investors because those investors can be connect, well connected. The best way to privatize would be the British model. That is, you float and you gradually reduce the state's uh, take. And the purchases will have to bid on the open, open market. But the downside is that it's a long process. And in the meantime, those companies can be looted by insiders. So that's the, the downside. But uh, in terms of fighting corruption in general, uh, the proven methods are not that unusual. You need a free press that can monitor officials. Uh, you need N NGOs who can uh, help out in watching the officials. You need disclosure, strict disclosure, enforceable disclosure of official assets. Every year they have to declare verifiable, and if they sign something that's false, they can be in serious legal trouble. And then finally, you need an independent judiciary that can prosecute wrongdoing in a transparent and credible way. Because right now, China has a very powerful anti-corruption agency, but it's totally opaque. And it, uh, it follows procedures that are blatantly in violation of the Chinese constitution. Chinese officials have no constitutional rights. <laughs> uh, and so their prosecution, uh, imprisonment, or uh, sentencing are, not, are all political decisions. And that does not inspire confidence in the system. Uh, Jim Feinerman from Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, two uh, perhaps unrelated points, but uh, one, it just goes to the uh, the question of something like an independent commission against corruption, such as Hong Kong created. When I lived there 40 years ago, yes. it was just being formulated, but it's, yeah. it seemed to have made significant inroads in a place where people assumed that corruption was forever the way and yeah. it was never going to change. And you've already addressed some of the things that um, you know are, are problematic with that, respect to creating that in, in the mainland. And then the other thing, the institutions that you and I are, are, are at, uh, our universities, may be colluding, uh, at least in a very modest way, with some Bye. of this corruption. We admit the children. Admit the children, yeah. Uh, and, and it's pretty clear that um, there's no guarantee that it's their academic merits or, or other things. You know, Bo Gua Gua, the, uh, the son of Bo Xi Lai, is now a second year law student at Columbia Law School, yeah. after having been at the Kennedy School at Harvard and at Oxford and at a, a British uh, public yeah. school before then. So um, you know, I, I'm sure he's got uh, at least significant hooks into his family's ill-gotten gains. So despite the fact that his mother and father are never leaving a Chinese jail, um, you never know. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, the idea of an independent commission on uh, uh, um, uh, fighting corruption is very popular, but the, the catch in the Chinese context uh, is it independent from the party? I mean, this is the key because the party does not want this. Uh, Agents to be independent from the party, so that's that's a no-go. And uh, in terms of our culpability in all of, all of this, it, the only consolation is that the Ivies are a lot more guilty than we are. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Yeah. We have a question in back there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Katie Wang with Newtown Dynasty Television. I have two questions. Uh, first the question is about Hong Kong. Uh, we know Hong Kong has much better uh, political system than mainland China. Uh, but uh, uh, how do you think about, the l in the long run, the rule of law in Hong Kong? Will that be affected by the mainland more um, interaction with mainland China or influenced uh, by them? And the, the second question is about uh, the military power. Uh, we know every day, um, nowadays, people are very concerned about the growth of Chinese military power. Uh, but how does this corruption uh, issue affect the capability of Chinese military. Thank yeah, you. Uh, again, uh, both are very important questions. Uh, I think so far, the last 17 years, uh, the Hong Kong judiciary has remained surprisingly and pleasantly independent. Uh, but uh, the future, you, we really cannot guarantee because the, one of the more troubling developments in the last year is uh, the central government's demand that the judiciary should love the country. So do they have to love? The judiciary loves the law. They should not love anybody else except the law. <laughs> so that, that's troubling. Uh, uh, then uh, the Chinese uh, 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 military, uh, I always have the view that the Chin Chinese military capabilities have, have been grossly exaggerated because they have to apply combat effectiveness organization, and then you apply a huge corruption discount uh, because we don't know how much they actually paid for their Russian hardware, right? Because this is corruption on two sides. The Russians might have overcharged a lot and the Chinese might have overpaid a lot. So the real conversion of resources into effective c combat capability may be very, very low. So that's why I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm skeptical. Of the, I think they've made enormous progress, uh, but uh, uh, not as uh, uh, fearful, fearsome as uh, some of us would like us to believe. Do we have any other questions? All right. Well, we're almost out of time anyway, so I think we'll wrap up there. Uh, thank you very much okay. for this fascinating uh, talk. And uh, thank you. Thank you.